Rwanda has emerged to become one of the fastest growing economies in Africa and the world today. At the outset, we prioritize laying a foundation of security, peace, reconciliation, and unity. We set out to ensure that Rwanda's rapid high growth was sustainable and inclusive, with nobody left behind. Through bold and consistent reforms, Rwanda today is one of the world's best places to do business. We have transformed our landlocked country into a land-linked, modern, connected, and progressive economy. Rwanda has some of the most advanced ICT infrastructure in the region and is an emerging innovation hub in Africa. Rwanda has established itself as a proof of concept destination, attracting innovators seeking to develop, test, and scale their business models in Rwanda and beyond. Rwanda is emerging as a premier financial hub with the Kigali International Finance Center providing an attractive destination for investors seeking opportunities across the African continent. The center is also ranked among the top five financial centers in Africa. The country is reputed for being one of the most remarkable tourism destinations in the world. We have consistently diversified our tourism sector. In a span of a few years, Rwanda is now ranked the second most popular destination in Africa for hosting international conferences and events. And it is emerging as a leading sports events destination on the continent. Like the rest of the world, Rwanda was disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. However, our response was swift and robust, gaining global recognition. We have surpassed the World Health Organization's vaccination target, ensuring the health and safety of our people. To safeguard businesses and jobs, we have invested $250 million through the Economic Recovery Fund and implemented innovative incentive programs to drive rapid recovery in priority sectors such as manufacturing, agro-processing, and construction. We have also invested in empowering our young, talented workforce with skills for tomorrow. This is why we have partnered with world-class learning institutions to establish their continental campuses in vibrant and cosmopolitan centers across the country. A strong innovation culture has also been established with a particular focus on developing talent in the ICT sector. As we accelerate towards our Vision 2050, our development gains will not be sustainable if we do not protect our planet. Rwanda has an ambitious climate action plan to secure a clean and sustainable world for future generations. There is a lot more to discover about Rwanda and its opportunities. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming to uh, this Rwanda session at the uh, FII uh, 23. My name is uh, Francis Gattare, and I'm a CEO of uh, Rwanda Development Board. And uh, what we do is um, promote investments into Rwanda, uh, carry out reforms that make Rwanda the best place to do business, and also advise government on how best to relate with the private sector. And so we are happy that uh, you have joined us uh, to hear the story about Rwanda. How many of you here have been to Rwanda before? Yeah? OK. Uh, the rest of you who have not been to Rwanda yet, I hope you enjoyed the quick uh, journey into Rwanda through the short video. And uh, after uh, my presentation, I hope that you will uh, also consider to visit Rwanda and see with your own eyes uh, what we are showcasing to you here today, okay? Uh, so, so I'm going to walk you through a quick presentation that I have prepared. Um, and this presentation is um, really to uh, showcase Rwanda as an investment destination, okay? Uh, I'll make it quick. Uh, I'll also show you uh, why, where you would consider to do a business in terms of sectors, in terms of projects, and, uh, and we'll discuss also the different incentives that would, uh, you would require or that would incentivize you to, um, to thrive in the business sector in Rwanda. Okay, 
So, as you have seen in the video, uh, Rwanda is really a growing economy. Uh, we have come from a very low base uh, over the last 30 years, uh, but we have had some very impressive milestones, uh, if you consider where we came from. Um, I seem to be standing in front of you. There, there, there are multiple uh, screens, by the way, uh, if you're sitting I know this is a large one and more convenient, but the smaller ones also are projecting the same message. If you look at the growth trajectory of Rwanda, uh, we have consistently uh, been a fast-growing economy. And um, compared to many of our peers, uh, over the last 10 years, we have consistently outperformed them in growth numbers. But that also is because of the role of the private sector. And this is uh, as a result of many reforms that we have carried out to make Rwanda business friendly and, and competitive. But many social policies as well to make the country inclusive, whether it's in gender, whether it's in poverty alleviation, whether in social mobility and many other forms of inclusiveness to bring uh, the whole population into economic activities. We have um, grown the logistics and um, uh, link to the rest of the world for trade and business. Uh, through air travel and, and, and ground uh, connectivity as well. We have impact on regional integration to grow our market size. Rwanda by its own is not a large market. However, we have created the East African community. Uh, we have created uh, the African free trade uh, area, all of which provide larger market access for our businesses as a result. Um, we have a number of businesses that have uh, started operating in Rwanda, and many of which are startups. So Rwanda is now known uh, as a startup economy, uh, where um, uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, early concepts, ideas can be grown and nurtured. And, and you can see a number of now famous companies. Zipline is... Uh, now a multi-billion dollar uh, market capitalized um, uh, company that started in Rwanda with, uh, with drones delivering blood and medicine in the rural areas. Uh, at the beginning, it was not known by anyone. Now it's a very successful company. Um, ICAD is a France-based uh, medical uh, technology company that does uh, uh, non-intrusive uh, complex surgeries, now is established in Rwanda. Um, many uh, other companies, Norsken, a, a Swedish uh, startup incubator, um, Volkswagen, we all know it. Uh, BioNTech, uh, now starting uh, mRNA vaccine manufacturing in Rwanda, launching in December, the first outside Europe. Okay. Uh, so Rwanda's economy is highly diversified and many sectors are uh, contributing to the macro level growth numbers that we have seen. And that's the story that is behind the growth numbers uh, that we have showed you. With respect to a number of projects that we would like to hi uh, highlight to you and interest you, healthcare is one of the very important uh, sectors that we want to generate additional growth. Earlier, President Kagame spoke in plenary and talked about uh, human capital growth and how Rwanda's human capital is the cornerstone of our economy and the cornerstone of our national development. So, so if you look at the numbers in Africa, over a billion dollars is spent by African patients going abroad for treatment, mainly to India, but also to other places. And many of these treatments they go to are uh, not even very complex one. And so in Rwanda, we are developing uh, a medical and health hub uh, with specialized services to be able to capture uh, much of this, much of this um, uh, market by offering uh, cutting edge technology and innovative research. So, so we have ongoing projects that are already uh, established in Rwanda. And we want to leverage those and attract additional investments to build that hub. And so we have uh, a project that is seeking additional investment of up to $500 million in partnership with the government, 
and also Rwanda's private sector. We would like to seek um, investors that are uh, knowledgeable in this sector, uh, that want to create impact in the health sector, uh, to come and partner with us in growing this uh, and impact on the wider African uh, healthcare uh, sector. King Faisal Hospital. 36 years ago, um, Rwanda partnered with the uh, Saudi Development Fund and started a new hospital in Rwanda. It was named uh, then King Faisal Hospital. It's still called King Faisal Hospital. It's a, a major link between our two countries, um, Rwanda and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It is now uh, the largest and, uh, and, and most important referral hospital, but also a, a, a teaching hospital. Around it, uh, there is a program to grow and expand its services, to grow its uh, uh, inpatient capacity, and provide some uh, modern uh, therapies uh, so that we can support not only the Rwandan population, but the wider region and, 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 and Africa as well. Already, there are a number of African patients that come to this hospital. Uh, that's why we need to expand its capacity. And it's uh, providing very needed services uh, to our community. Uh, it has a required investment value of about $208 million. And again, this is in partnership with the government. It's operating at a purely, uh, as a purely private hospital, even though the initial investments are, are by the government. In agriculture, we all know that food security for our continent and for every country really is critical. Especially this became apparent during the pandemic uh, where every country was becoming increasingly reliant on itself, on its neighbors and its region. And so Rwanda has continued to grow its agriculture base to support national food security, but also to grow its um, agriculture exports. And part of that strategy is to, um, to do more than agriculture and put technology into it, develop farmland, uh, put infrastructure into it, irrigation infrastructure, uh, electricity, water, and, uh, and transport infrastructure, so that those who want to do farming can actually leverage the infrastructure investments by the government. So, so we have um, this area that we call Gabiro Agribusiness Hub, where the government has um, developed more than 15,000 uh, 15, hectares of land, uh, irrigation, and, uh, and, and with that infrastructure in place. There is a phase one completed, already handed over to the farmers, and there's a phase two that is under development that government is looking for partnership uh, with private investors. The business model here uh, is, is twofold. One is uh, to develop and then lease to the, to the farmers, uh, or it's also to develop and actually farm it and generate rev additional revenue from farming and, and production processing uh, or distribution. Uh, each company comes with their own uh, business model and, and, and it's open. So we have additional investment required of $100 million uh, to grow this Gabiro Agribusiness Hub uh, to increase agriculture production, both for domestic, regional, and, and, and export. In the same sector in agriculture, we have Rwandan companies that have been growing uh, they are rich outside the country. Uh, Rwanda is naturally not a very large country, and so companies that have been expanding their operations want to uh, obtain land elsewhere. And we have currently uh, multiple companies in Rwanda that have asked us to promote them. Uh, they have acquired land outside Rwanda, in Mozambique, in Congo, uh, Congo Brazzaville, in uh, Central African Republic, uh, to expand their agriculture mechanization programs. And um, in some of these countries, land is not scarce. Uh, it's more abundantly ava available and more uh, and very uh, arable. And so these companies are seeking partnership uh, with uh, international investors to increase their capital base for development of agriculture in these countries. So uh, we are happy to promote them here and also to uh, 
be their line of contact uh, for companies that see this as an interesting proposition. Mining uh, in natural resources, um, mining is increasingly being an important uh, factor, especially in the current uh, uh, energy transition. And in Rwanda, we have um, uh, both precious and critical minerals, especially for the energy transition. Uh, we have been carrying out uh, mineral exploration. In my previous job, I have served as a minister for mines, petroleum, and gas in my country. And uh, the primary objective mainly was to do as much extensive exploration of our mineral resources as possible. And as a result, we have discoveries and mapped out uh, concession areas for various min uh, minerals, including uh, lithium, gold, uh, rare earth minerals, which are very important uh, in the current technology phases we are in. What we call the three T's are our traditional minerals, yeah? Uh, tin, tungsten, and tantalum, people who are not familiar with the mining sector may not find them knowledgeable, but these are very important minerals uh, in the technology space, yeah? Um, and then uh, precious gemstones. What we have as a country is a map that shows uh, the prospective uh, concession areas, and we usually offer um, both exploration as well as ex exploitation or extraction licenses uh, more than 20 years renewable, depending on the size and the, and the capital um, uh, intended to be deployed. Uh, of course, uh, for every country, we always encourage domestic beneficiation, which is processing and then um, increasing, increasingly add value to the domestic uh, minerals. As in agriculture, also in the minerals and mining sector, we have Rwandan companies and non-Rwandan companies, uh, but international companies that start best in, in Rwanda, uh, that have expanded abroad and sold uh, concessions elsewhere. Uh, again, uh, there are concessions that have been obtained in various minerals, in diamond, in gold, nickel, copper, uh, platinum group minerals, uh, as well as graphite, uh, coal, and lithium. These are very, very prospective concessions, most of which would have been already carried out in exploration uh, with licenses ready for operating and often uh, already running them at small scale and looking for scaling up. And so we want to promote these companies as well uh, to uh, get partnership with uh, investors that see this as very interesting. Many of these minerals, as you would recognize, are um, very critical in the energy transition, uh, particularly for, um, uh, for battery technologies, whether it's graphite, whether it's lithium, nickel, and others. Rwanda is growing, and as it grows, the demand for real estate uh, also grows. And so we have a number of initiatives that are seeking investments in the property and real estate development. One of these is called the Kigali Innovation City. As, as our capital city, Kigali, grows, there is an emerging hub that is combining technology companies with universities and research centers. And as a result, you, you get to see clusters of innovation emerging. And the Kigali Innovation City is a more deliberate one. Uh, because around it, there are a number of universities, like uh, Carnegie Mellon University, the African Leadership University, the uh, University of Rwanda's Center for Excellence in Biomedical Engineering, we're talking about vaccines and all that. That's where the vaccine manufacturing their best. Uh, you know, BioNTech and, and, and Cooper Pharma from, 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 from Egypt also established itself there. So there are a number of people who are living there, and we are seeking uh, investments to expand this Kigali Innovation City, both for offices, for student housing, because there's a lot of students there uh, that require housing, uh, but also um, for residential areas uh, for people working in that, in that area. What the government has done is uh, mapped it. We have developed the ground infrastructure, so the roads, electricity, 
uh, sewers and, uh, and all kinds of uh, 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 civil works done there. And it's an area that now is developing uh, into a cluster of uh, technology hub. And there is a, a need for additional investment, $100 million, to expand the Kigali Innovation City. Yeah. Park Lane is a new development initiative that is in the center of Kigali. Next to it is the uh, Kigali Convention Center and Hotel, uh, which is housed for most of our uh, conference, conferences and meetings, uh, very active part of, uh, uh, of, of the city of Kigali. Uh, also with a number of uh, uh, business and, and office towers. And so the Park Lane Tower is a new development by one of our local entrepreneurs. And uh, it's a 19 floor mixed use complex. And uh, they are seeking partnerships to develop this. They have already put in uh, a lot of uh, their capital already. It's a prime location, and uh, the estimated investment requirement is $62 uh, million. There is a, a new residential uh, neighborhood that is growing in Kigali. It's called Vision City. Vision City is a, a residential neighborhood that was started by our pension fund, the National Pension Fund. Um, it, you know, it carries all our savings and invests it in the country uh, and some of it outside. And, uh, and, and so this is one of their uh, flagship projects. And they just finished phase one, uh, which is fully subscribed and already occupied and purchased. They are now investing into a phase two, uh, which is a large project. Uh, almost 1,500 residential units of uh, uh, Vision City 2 and they are currently developing some model homes for people to review and to book and all that, uh, so that they can uh, de-risk it in advance. Uh, it's also planned to have a, a single uh, five-star hotel and about 30 large-scale um, prime villas and more than 687 uh, residential uh, areas there as well. And there is a capital requirement of about $296 million uh, to partner with them. It's a highly liquid pension fund, um, but their business model is always to look for other partners so that they are not doing it alone. Uh, so we are promoting them to seek partnerships so that they can have um, uh, other investors to, uh, to partner with them. There is a growing, I must say, there's a growing market um, of many buyers and, and, and especially non-resident buyers of property in Rwanda uh, that consider Kigali as their home, uh, maybe part-time homes uh, coming from everywhere, uh, across Africa and outside Africa. There's a growing uh, also trend of uh, European and North American uh, retiring families that choose to come and live in, in Africa, and Rwanda is one of their uh, choice destinations. So a lot of these are also uh, are going into that category of buyers of homes. Uh, I would be happy to explain more. There is a high impact middle income neighborhood also uh, that is coming up. This is not the first one. Uh, there's always a, a round of investments in what we call affordable housing category. Yeah? And there is over 30,000 um, gap in the demand of the middle income uh, high impact homes. These homes tend to be very uh, quick to purchase, quick to sell, uh, because there is a large government support to it. Um, there's a subsidy that comes in land. Government will usually provide land, provide infrastructure, especially uh, ground uh, road infrastructure, electricity connection, um, uh, and, and other forms of utilities, water, and internet connection. And then investors usually would put up the buildings with the condition that uh, we have uh, a value cap of $40,000 at value to, for it to be in the affordable housing category. But because of the large subsidy that goes into land and infrastructure, uh, this is not very hard to get. 
And so we are promoting a new development of um, 30,000 units, starting with whichever uh, size one can, uh, can manage. And, and, and government will provide um, that ground infrastructure required. It's a very important and high impact investment, especially for the uh, businesses that have uh, you know, social community impact in mind. Uh, this is a very, a very good project to consider. Telecoms. So the telecom sector, as you know, is a very lucrative one for a long time. Today, Rwanda is operated with two uh, dominant operators, but we see that the market is ready for a third operator license, yeah? And especially because government has access to some general infrastructure uh, that would be bundled into this third license, particularly uh, broadband infrastructure. Knowing that the market trend is now shifting more from voice to data, uh, this is a very important proposition for a third license, and some of you uh, may find this very interesting uh, in your business arrangement. And the expected uh, investment is wide, a range between 200 to 300 million dollars uh, for this third license and the associated infrastructures. Okay, so, so, so that's really it, and I thank you for paying attention to, um, to my pitch to you. And uh, I hope that we can invite you to Rwanda and you walk the journey of development with us. Thank you very much. Okay, so going forward, uh, I want to make myself available for any questions. I also have other colleagues here. Um, we have the Minister of um, Technology, Innovation, and uh, Digital Economy, um, uh, Paula Ingabire. Uh, we have uh, our Minister of State and the Minister of Finance, um, uh, Janine Munyeshuri also, she's here with me. Uh, I have my colleague, um, Mauro Lorenzo, also who works uh, with the government of Rwanda. Uh, all of us here available to answer any questions. And in fact, uh, we thought that maybe we could split into some sectors. Um, depending on, uh, on the interest. Let, let me test uh, this and see. Uh, in my presentation, I had uh, agriculture, healthcare, resources, mining, and, uh, and, and, and telecoms, yeah? Uh, so let me see by show of hands so that we see if we can split and save, uh, save time. Uh, who might be interested to discuss more on healthcare? Yeah, fantastic. I'll pair you up with Mauro, yeah? Uh, who would be interested to discuss more about uh, agriculture and mining, perhaps? Agriculture, yes, and mining, very good. So, so um, Janine, you, you handle that, yeah? And who would be interested to discuss, uh, let's say, uh, real estate property development, other services, uh, trade, logistics, and anything else? All the others, then, then you, you, stick, you stick with me, okay? Okay, you stick with me. So, so we'll create corners. I'll be here, yeah? So everything else uh, that is not telecoms and, and digital economy, which is polar, uh, natural resources, so agriculture, mining, and everything with, uh, uh, with, with Janine, yeah? And uh, let's uh, split with that. Maybe we can even go to the corner. I'm sorry? General questions first? Okay, yes, absolutely, yeah. So some general questions that are not sector specific, you're right. Yeah, taxation, uh, rules, regulations, uh, transport, cost of this, cost of that. Yeah, general questions, I'm happy to take those. Yes, please. Question regarding education. If, if, you, if, you, could, if you could elaborate a little bit around education and, and talent in Rwanda. Okay. Education and talent, I'll give it to you, Paula. Thank you very much, Francis. I, I think um, if I start with education, one, our policy as a government is uh, investing in our people. 
uh, because most of the industries that we've highlighted here, if you had the opportunity to follow the session our president had earlier today, he also touched on some of the key uh, high growth sectors for the economy. And all of that is built around the need to build the critical mass of talent that supports these different industries. Um, we have set ourselves up as a Pan-African hub for talent. That, in, that means we have been able to attract world-class leading universities to come and set up presence in Rwanda to skill Rwandans and Africans and anyone that is interested in world-class education and getting it from the African continent. The second thing that we do um, as a country is to figure out what are those critical niche skills that are required for every industry, whether it's healthcare, whether it's agriculture, technology, and really creating uh, customized programs that allow us to build uh, the, that talent pipeline that is going to be required by the different industries within those different uh, sectors. Um, the other thing uh, that we're putting in place from an immigration policy is uh, creating um, you know, a very attractive uh, policy around attracting talent into Rwanda um, in a way that allows for most of the multinational global companies to come and set up um, uh, uh, their, their operations in Rwanda, but also tap into this growing uh, pipeline of talent that we have. So there is education that is happening in, in really ensuring that the industry is feeding into how we redesign the curriculum in schools. Uh, there is the reskilling and upskilling that is happening at the workforce level because you know every trade, every profession gets disrupted, whether it's because of technology, whether it's because of new um, you know skills that are required. And then there's the my immigration policy that allows us then to also attract talent and give them a place uh, where they can contribute uh, to a Pan-African vision. Thank you. We have another question here. Oh yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Dianga, and uh, I come from Kenya. So I heard you talk about everything, but I didn't hear you talk about, let's say, video game and video games and esports. And it's one of the things that is taking the globe by, you know, it's it's the thing that people are talking about right now. And I believe Africa, we should be looking at this. So I would like to know, since I'm your neighbor and I already practicing a lot of esports on that side. What are you guys doing over there in Rwanda and how can we work together to bring Africa to the same stage as the, as the rest of the world? Thank, Thank you. you. And, and I also know that particularly Kenya has also put in place a strategy around esports. I think it was recently also announced. And um, so one, the, the presentation that was shared here was to give some of the very um, you know, uh, immediate priorities that we're looking at. It doesn't mean that we are disregarding the other sectors. In fact, Rwanda has a very strong MICE strategy that anchors itself around building a sports hub um, uh, for the continent in Rwanda. And um, the intersection of sports and technology creates that perfect opportunity uh, to promote esports uh, type of activities. And so uh, what we're particularly looking at, again, with all of these new industries that you're looking at, you, you start by creating the talent that is going to fuel innovations coming in those kind of fields, attracting the kind of partnerships that allow you to grow those particular segments. And then as you build skills, you're building for those particular operations that are happening. And so eSports is a component of uh, the sports hub strategy that Rwanda uh, already has in place. And I like what you ended off on in terms of how do we create um, the right partnerships as a neighbor, but also as two countries that have ambitions in building um, you know, an esports hub uh, that, that really uh, supports these kind of activities. And I, I believe what we can do is getting our teams um, that are already looking at these uh, niche uh, sectors to sit and co-create a strategy that allows for that kind of collaboration to happen, uh, but also really looking at what are those building blocks, like skills, infrastructure, the financing that is required uh, to grow such industries. Back to you, Francis. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the session. I wasn't here in the beginning, but um, uh, I wanted to ask about your coffee. So I visited Rwanda, I went to the village, I did the dance, I spoke to people on the street, I spoke to people in hotels. I went guerrilla trekking to start with, but I ended up in a village somewhere staying three days inside the village. So I actually did my part of Rwanda. I congratulate you for a country that is united. To be very honest, I was shocked. 
And at the same time, I was so impressed, and I was attending your president's speech, and it was really, really nice. Um, one thing that took me uh, by storm is your coffee beans and your, your coffee farms and the way you do coffee and the love that goes behind it. And my eyes was always fixed or one on this. And I was waiting maybe, I was very happy to, um, to see NFII that Rwanda has some presence in it. So if you have anything to elaborate on that or that would be great. Yeah, uh, Rwandan coffee, amazing, yeah. Uh, one is, um, it's Highland coffee. Uh, the, 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 the average altitude of where our coffee grows is uh, somewhere between uh, two to 3,000 uh, meters above sea level. So, so uh, it's cool. Uh, it's growing, it's, it's uh, Arabica coffee, uh, so, so uh, very high quality. But most importantly, uh, what you call the love that goes into, into the coffee, is, is how it's looked after on the field. Yeah, so we, we call it from field to cup. Uh, so the love goes in the coffee from the field all the way to the cup. Uh, it's it's um, uh, well looked after in the field, but processing. Uh, Rwanda's coffee, uh, majority of it is, uh, we call it uh, specialty coffee, which is um, a fully washed coffee. So it's not the kind that you will dry and, and maybe roast um, uh, b b b before it's, uh, it's removed from. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's processed using water. So when, when the cherries are ripe, uh, they, they, are, they are fully washed so that the bin actually remains clean without any of the husks or the flesh around it. And that's very important because uh, it makes the, uh, the bins uh, really intact and keep their flavor and, and they're dry dried. Uh, fully before, before roasting, and that's what goes into the, the care that makes Rwanda's coffee really special, yeah. But, but how can we invest in coffee? Is there investing open? <laughs> I know your coffee is amazing, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here trying to invest in your coffee. So Fantastic. are there any investing opportunities in coffee? So, so there are at various levels of the value chain, right? Um, one is, uh, well, our coffee is, is very good, uh, it's not yet being grown at large scale. So, so the, 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 the big gap is on, in the volume that we are able to produce. So starting from actual farming, yeah? So, so that's where the starting point would be to grow at scale. Uh, and, and then secondly, in the processing, uh, to add value in the processing, we have a challenge that most of the coffee has got to be exported when they're still green beans. Uh, uh, there is an argument that goes into that, but we want to find a way that we can actually add value, including roasting, packaging properly, and then you, you, you know, we export to international markets um, coffee that has extra value left, not only to the farmers, but also adding jobs uh, to, to other em 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 employment opportunities in the country. Yeah. What is your business model? Where, where in the value chain do you find that you could plug in? Because you know about, a bit about coffee, and then we could facilitate you actually to, to orient you in that. To, to, be, to be very honest, um, I founded the family business. I'm a bit young, but I founded our family business in uh, 2014. Yeah. And today we have a huge portfolio mainly in real estate hospitality. But um, uh, as part of the family business, we do actually do VCs, PEs, uh, we SMEs, we go into all of that. I think uh, the future of real estate comes into logistics transportation, which is something related to EV and cars and all of that, and at the same time, farms. And looking at the second most liquid black uh, asset in life, I think coffee beans are. And um, I think Rwanda is under the radar. Uh, I fly the world to drink coffee in different places as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And when I visited Rwanda and I went to the one and only the Nest, yeah. and I had their coffee made from a certain company in Rwanda that I don't want to say the name, maybe yeah. you have a conflict of interest. <laughs> uh, I started sorting coffee beans from them. Yeah. And as a proof of concept to myself, I bought more than 50 kilos. I got them with me in packages and I started giving my friends and the coffee shops that are local in Dubai where I reside. I'm originally Saudi, but I run the family business from Dubai. And every single person that I give them those coffee beans, they were just blown away and asking for more. So I thought there is an opportunity there. This goes all the way from the food chain. So I went to the farms, I 
peeled the red beans. I peeled them, I washed them, I smashed them with the big hoodie, we sang around it. I, I did the whole thing. So I think it's under the radar still, and I think there's a huge growth for that. And me being part here is to see how can we as foreign investors come and try to scale this by any way, either by owning the farms, mm. paying more to the village people who are paid very little compared to what happens towards the end, yeah. or in the processing, or in the transportation, or to distribute it internationally. There are so many ways. So I was just here to see and explore if there are any opportunities that can actually be appealing to foreign investors. Yeah. There are amazing opportunities, uh, and we want to listen also. And uh, because sometimes when you are caught up in that bubble, it's hard to know what opportunities lie out there. Uh, people like you who are facing the end of the market, uh, there are some good ideas you can bring to us. We are, we are really open and want to explore this because the traditional business model of processing and then retailing does not transfer enough value to you know, to the farmers. It, it, it takes value all the way uh, to, you know, to the uh, end sellers. Uh, but, but many uh, conscious um, investors like yourself can come up with uh, creative ideas that can transfer more value to the farmers. We want to listen uh, because it's very important that this resource gives value to those who, who make it. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. So let me ask um, Julia. Um, you know, one of the emerging sectors in Rwanda is on conferences, hosting visitors, bringing um, meetings to Rwanda. And by coincidence, here is Judy, someone that is coming to Rwanda with a major conference next week. Next week. Oh. Francis, thank you so much. My name's Julia Simpson. I'm CEO and President of the World Travel and Tourism Council. Uh, we represent private sector in travel and tourism. And last year, here in Riyadh, we held a massive uh, summit uh, last December. Um, but what I wanted to say is travel and tourism in Rwanda is growing at double the rate as it is elsewhere in the world. It's a growth sector, particularly tech. Um, I've been to tra um, Rwanda now four times. And what I was absolutely impressed with, I think, you know, I arrived with a certain amount of unconscious bias. So I have to say that's a polite way of putting it. Um, I've never met such a cleaner, safer, well-educated, warm country. And um, it's unbelievably impressive. And it is very, very safe. And I think, you know, we do sadly on the continent of Africa sometimes see, um, you know, pr problems. But that's certainly, thank goodness, not, not the case. And yes, you did emerge from a horrendous period in your history, but you've emerged so much stronger. And I think by facing that and dealing with it, you've become, everyone is Rwandan now. Um, and the young people, very young population, very, very focused on delivery. So I'm planning on bringing a thousand investors next week to Rwanda from the hotel sector. They will come from all the largest companies globally in tech, um, in hotel building, in oddly enough, even in cruise, even though Rwanda has beautiful lakes, but it is landlocked, um, right across the sector. Uh, last time we were in Saudi Arabia, we, my members invested $50 billion. I, I don't imagine it will get to that same sum at this stage, but we are very, very proud to be hosting our very first travel and tourism um, meeting in, in Rwanda. So thank you very much, Francis, and good luck. And I would be investing. I'm going to be investing. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. I want to hear from you. Yeah. I, I, I think you have an opinion and a view on something. Um, yeah. So hi, my name is Patricia. I also work in travel, but I'm more in travel media. I'm a travel journalist. And uh, I also love Rwandan coffee very much. Uh, I've never been to Rwanda, but um, after watching this, I'm, I'm very into regenerative travel. So I understand what you mean by investing in a way where it gives benefits to the farmers, but not to just this generation, but for every generation, like uh, multiple generations into the future. So uh, that is very cool to hear. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Julie talk about um, bringing investors, but also like me thinking about regenerative 
um, investing in tourism, it's like, okay, how do you invest in a country in a way that keeps the culture, keeps the money in the country, and um, keeps the, like, the environment? You know, like, so, because I, I grew up in, in Thailand, and I've seen it develop <laughs> in different ways, and uh, I've seen, like, the darker side of tourism, where it's like, okay, well, maybe we can learn from those mistakes, right? Uh, it, yeah, so that, that's why I'm here. I'm interested in the coffee, the travel, the gorillas, but also, like, the, the culture. Like, uh, who are the Rwandan people before the, the, that very sad history? What is the music? What is, you know, like, I'm interested in that. The music, the history, the, yeah. So um, I'm, I would love to learn more. Thank you. Yeah. We would like to invite you to come and visit. Yeah, um, yeah. We make sure that you know the contact we have made here today becomes an important seed that creates that, um, yeah, that continues that curiosity, and leads you to Rwanda soon. Maybe you can come attend the conference with Julie next week. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Hi. I just turned off. So. Yeah. Please. <laughs> you get a mic. Uh, I do get a mic. What do I talk about? Um, I'm from Mauritius, so listening to this is actually quite interesting, right? We're part of Africa, but not really Africa. I'm always told, are you African? I'm like, I don't look like one, but I am. Um, right? So we're part of the African community, and, and it's always been interesting. I think what I really struck to me, Julie, is when you say it's the safest place and you've ever been, and I would love to hear more about this, because we grew up in Mauritius always knowing Mauritius as the safest place in Africa, right? So that's why we've got a financial economy and a financial center. It is the most politically stable place to do business in Africa. Um, I, my name is Amberine. I run the first financial education platform for employees. We launched in the UAE last year. We're launching now in Saudi in a couple of weeks. Um, so I was just here to learn more about a place that's not too far from home in uh, and interesting to hear how, how much more of investment is, is, is happening because my next market is Africa. Um, I think financial literacy is something you guys absolutely need. I think financial literacy globally is, is, is very much required. I just spoke on a panel about um, uh, democratize, democratization of capital. And one of the um, continents I was really thinking about was Africa. It just the concept of breaking the cycle, I think you just mentioned about the next generation. So microfinancing, and so investment into the country for the farmers, like you just talked about, what happens is you break the cycle because if they have access to a small amount of capital, they can build up their businesses, whether it's coffee business or whatever it might be, the kids become more educated, the standard of living goes up, those kids actually turn out to be higher income living standards and it breaks the cycle of the never ending, right? Social mobility, so the whole capital aspect and access to capital is absolutely key, and it has a multiplier effect. It's not just one person, it's a whole generation of people, and that money goes back at work, and it goes through into the economy. I mean, if you think about the US in the last 20 years, unprecedented significant increase in economy, purely due to democratization of capital, and technology has allowed this. So I'm not sure how technology advanced. Again, I don't know anything about Rwanda, um, but one of the examples that's great to take is with technology intake, which I, th I know Africa is very big on, right? You've got M-Pesa, you've got, you're way further than from a fintech mobility, you're way further than many of us. Um, but it's about learning the experience of the multiplier effect of, of bringing capital into the country. Thank you, thank you very much. Can I indulge you? You are here, you've got a mic. Talk about Rwanda. Talking about Rwanda, hello everyone. Unfortunately, I was a bit late um, to come to the session. Um, my name is Andrea Prerat. I'm uh, originally from Vienna, Austria. We have great coffee as well and coffee shops, by the way. Um, so uh, speaking about Rwanda, my background is politics. And I remember when I was studying, there was Rwanda and there was Bosnia, right? Because of this very, I wouldn't say same, but similar uh, tragic history, and I'm very happy to see how Rwanda evolved during the last few years, unlike, unfortunately, Bosnia uh, in uh, Europe. I now work for an organization by Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed in Abu Dhabi. I'm based in Dubai, and uh, we were in Rwanda last year for the Kigali uh, Summit. It's basically a summit on neglected tropical diseases. 
And as mentioned here, Rwanda, very safe. I was really astonished by the people, by uh, the organization itself. Uh, so um, I, I really, really am looking forward to hear more. And I'm really happy from this perspective, from a political global health perspective, what is more to come. And also uh, congratulations to all of you. So thank you, everyone. So I, I think this marks the end of, uh, of this Rwanda session here. Another session will be coming up. Uh, I want to say thank you for uh, coming and thank you for the curiosity to learn about Rwanda and to know how you can uh, make impact and invest in Rwanda and do business with Rwanda. Please make sure that before you leave, you take my contact. I would love to stay in touch with you so that we can give you additional information and uh, hopefully uh, bring you to Rwanda one day very soon. Thank you. Have a good day.